Please don't sing. Why? You're not good at it. Ah, is it? Uh, I don't care. Uh, so, anyways, uh, competency gap. Yes. So, uh, no, 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 no. It's 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 just it's just the uh, Danny Kruger. Oh yes. <laughs> so so I just simply don't care. The, the famous effect, yeah. Yes. Good so for you. let's let's uh, start uh, from what I gathered when while we were talking before the actual thing. Today's session is going to be on Ansible automation, orchestration, and all that jazz. Uh, this is the ID show, and let's roll the intro and see what is going to happen next. Okay, my idea for this episode was related to previous two episodes that we did. And we said that we are going to do like a piecemeal approach towards most of the services that we, uh, were on those, um, on those roadmaps. Some of them may be, may be, may be multiple per episode, etc. Et but Ansible deserves more than a few episodes, actually. We can talk, both talk about that one for many, many hours. So... Um, I would also like to talk a little bit uh, about the um, Red Hat education related to Ansible 2. You recently had an exam that you passed for that one as well. I passed it a couple of years ago. And uh, so the topics today are going to be some practical examples, some simple stuff related to Ansible, uh, some, let's say, recommendations in terms of how to learn. Okay. And perhaps some, let's say, a vision for some of the future episodes that we might do with a little bit more complex topics related to Ansible. Today, we are going to keep it simple and lean. We're going to talk about some, some playbooks, the idea behind Ansible, the idea behind infrastructure, uh, infrastructure as a code. And I'm going to show some examples of the YAMLs that I prepared recently for our students, actually, who are getting ready for a competition a couple of weeks ago. So I have fresh examples that we can use. OK, you just triggered me. I did? Yes, because you, you said because you use the word we are going to a uh, word uh, we are going to be uh, simple and lean. Okay. So we are switching to lean uh, development. Yes. Yes. Agile, yes. Yes. Lean. Yes. Agile lead and yes, so on. And so on. Yes. Um, let's start from the beginning because I want to ask a thing. Uh, okay. The thing is this: uh, Are the servers supposed to be pets or cattle? I don't care. Yes, you do, because you are right now proposing the Ansible orchestration of the way and everything else. And the uh, this is the cattle way. OK. The pet way is just to have your own private server for server from and uh, carefully craft everything that is running on the servers. And to be completely honest, this is what most people do. I don't care. I, I like both approaches. They both have their use cases. So that's why I don't care. OK. Uh, I would actually argue uh, perhaps in a little bit of a different direction. And this is the reason why I like Ansible. I, I think that you're going to kind of like uh, agree with that. No, no, no. I like, I like Ansible. Let's, no. let, let, let's, okay. just, let's just agree on agreeing. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Let's, let's agree on agreeing and then we're going to start disagreeing. Later. Yes. That's good. Good approach. Uh, the reason why I like it is not only because of the fact that it enables me to do uh, orchestration and automation. That being said, I really do not do not necessarily like the YAML format or corresponding formats that a lot of other, let's say, DevOps approaches use. I don't like the XMLs, I don't like the JSONs, but this is something that's kind of inherent when you're an engineer, because we used to have college courses about that 20 plus years ago, when the state of technology was vastly different to what it is today. Back back in those days, you didn't even have an editor or a plugin in, let's say, a browser to check what XML or JSON actually are that you today have. But the, the real reason why I like it is because it enables me to do almost everything that I ever need to do in IT with one tool. The reason for that is because I can work with both open source and Windows because it supports uh, also... Um, uh, you know, managing uh, Microsoft-based operating systems. 
which means that I can extend that to any kind of cloud, whichever virtual machines I'm running. It's very well suited for anything Kubernetes OpenShift related as well, which kind of like goes naturally. And also at times it helps me immensely to configure other things that are not necessarily just physical OSs or virtual machines or containers, stuff like, let's say, switches, sometimes even storage devices, load balancers have loads of uh, additional modules for Ansible. And uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, I delivered a training for one of our clients. They wanted to do Cisco call manager management via Ansible. Yes. As well. So I point, pointed them in the direction for that. So basically, most of the things that I would like to do, uh, or most of the things that I cover in terms of infrastructure components, vast majority actually of them are doable via Ansible. That's my take. Oh, okay. But my, my take is that uh, love it or hate it, you have to have some uh, standard file format for whatever. <laughs> you have to have, okay, uh, YAML or uh, JSON or XML or whatever. You have to have a standard format. So love it or hate it, you have to have one. Okay. So it, it is going to be structured. YAML from those free by a country mile. Yes, but okay. But I'm pretty much more of the XML guy mm -hmm. because I have some some um, things about YAML that I passionately hate, That's okay. especially the tab spaces and so on. But yeah. uh, yes, indentation is indentation. Indentation is a problem. So I'm not in Fortran uh, days anymore. So I'm not going to uh, to play with the things that remind me of Fortran. But, but why? Anyways, so powerful, anyways even today. Uh, I completely agree on Ansible based on a completely different uh, idea. Okay. For me, Ansible is basically the reverse of documentation because it creates, it creates the idea that I can uh, configure something and at the same time, it is completely documented because the, if the Ansible playbook gets works, uh, that uh, means uh, works, the documentation, th yeah. this means that I know what I installed, how I installed it, and I know that uh, this playbook is going to change the configuration to comply to my documentation. So basically, we have gone one step, one step further from normal uh, programming. Normally, you program, then if you have the time, do the documentation, or you try to make comments. In this particular case, your entire configuration is the documentation itself. So every server is listed, every services is listed, all the relationship between services are listed and everything else that is running is listed. So it's an amazing tool. First and foremost, <laughs> you need to know the fact that he actually means that, but he also means that to trigger me because he knows what I think about uh, this uh, verbal diarrhea that he just made. So uh, because of the fact that I know how very tidy you are with your documentation, and just so that you know, I'm, okay. I'm of the same ilk. For me, uh, using Ansible as a metaphor for documentation is just like saying that eating crap is cool because sorry, but it's not. Um, and this is the reason why at times I've um, offered a little bit more than let's say just regular support for VMware products because they enable me to do documentation without any hassle. Uh, just today, I finished one of the NSX, NSXT courses for a very cool crew from uh, EMEA region. It was a private training for a very big company. And actually, I've, I've spent a gazillion amount of uh, minutes explaining to them how very tuned NSX as a platform to do security and networking and routing and all of those beautiful things is actually towards the idea of documentation, which I know that we both agree is one of the Achilles heel of IT. Because documentation in general for IT in most of the companies that I've ever been uh, to, not only doesn't exist, it is something that if you mention it, somebody is going to hit you with something in the head. I think that we should be creating a complete episode on documentation because this is one Agreed. of those topics. One of those topics that uh, always create uh, heat and create uh, unnecessary discussion about the, the reality that needs to happen. The necessary discussion on the reality because to be okay. Let's sum it up just uh, simply. Uh, I haven't met a company that had complete documentation, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, one of the most important takeaways from all the documentation that I ever saw in any every company uh, that I worked with was that if they thought that they have a document, uh, the mm -hmm. complete documentation, it was even a bigger problem than when they uh, thought that the documentation is not complete because they were depending on something that was obsolete. 
this reminds me of a story that our colleague tell, told me yesterday. He wrote a um, uh, his degree, undergrad degree, yes, and he had no references. And then his mentor told him, "I'm going to probably going to try to get you a Nobel Peace Prize because you have no references, which means you invented all of that." That's exactly what you're talking about. Yes, you know? yes, this is one of those things. And the other thing is that uh, I quickly googled up. There is a doc generator, the computation generator from Ansible playbooks. Yeah, I know, I know. That that can convert it to uh, meta files that are going to be created on the mark in in the markup so or markdown. So. Uh, documentation is one of those things, but okay, I completely agree on Ansible. Ansible is a great tool. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it has its own problems. It does. Let's start with the biggest one right now. Is Ansible going to remain free? Yeah, I have no idea. And we touched on this on the Red Hat episode a while ago, which was also quite popular. And a lot of people have been asking the same question. I know that um, uh, Jeff Gilling, who, who, was the, who is working on the Ansible a lot, dropped the support for the Red Hat. Yeah. And this is one of those things that make you actually say what is things going that make on. You go, mm -hmm. Yes, because what is going on, the Ansible is supposed to be a Red Hat uh, derived uh, technology. Mm -hmm. So it came from the Red Hat and now to not have support for major playbooks in the Red Hat is something that is, com that is completely off the rails. Yeah, I, I noticed a lot of chatter about this in the open source community. And I, I can tell you that people are already up in arms and saying that if uh, Red Hat does something about that to make it less than open source, that they are going to fork the old version and start developing it on their own. I know that this, this has been heavily discussed uh, online and I can definitely understand why. Because uh, having no capability to run Ansible code after running it for many, many years, because some policy shift that's crazy that kind of reminds me of a discussion that we had today on discord with our students you know uh, the the company that owns the unity framework you know they decided yeah, 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 that yes, they're know, going to license per installation stuff like that so basically if you install a unity based game on a, on your five computers that you paid for you're going to uh, the, the developer of the game is going to have to pay five times the license for the Not game installation only or something that, like the that. The problem is that they are now right now trying to make developers sign new contracts mm -hmm. that are basically going to make them uh, pay for the games that are already on the market for mm -hmm. years. And this is completely insane because uh, I mean, this is what worries me in terms yes, of Ansible. This, this is one of those things. Okay, but let, let's not talk about Unity. The thing that I want to talk about is does this remind you of, uh, just as a policy shift, does this remind you of when Oracle bought uh, MySQL? Yes, yes, exactly. That's that's the metaphor that... And I think that... that MariaDB, and I have to say that that metaphor scares the living crap out, crap out of me. But MariaDB is live and kicking. And I think that the, the, simple, the simple solution is simply to just go, okay, they're going to fork the project and it's going to be better. Yeah, but it, it's about the modules and the roles and, the, you know, all of the other things that are involved. That's, that's what scares a lot of people what's going to happen there because if they skip that and start doing something on their own it's going to be problematic okay i now, would understand why they would want to do that from a business perspective and nothing else there is no other reason uh for me i don't even understand the business perspective why would they, would they want to do it uh it could be just short-term gain if, uh, financially Mm -hmm. But I think in the long term, it is going to be uh, something that shouldn't be done. Uh, and I have no, I cannot not even think of any scenario that makes this viable as a business decision. So let, let's, let's, let's think that they are not going to do something like this. Exactly why we did the licensing episode yes. recently, because these sorts of overnight policy shifts in terms of how licensing works, etc., are a detriment to IT and they serve one purpose and one purpose only. It's only about the money, nothing else. And I think that right now the it's about the money and it's right now it's about trying to uh, reposition themselves because uh, there is a big repositioning going on. Uh, Red Hat and IBM are doing the repositioning on the open source market. Uh, Microsoft is trying to do a reposition themselves on the, um, on the cloud market. Uh, Google is repositioning themselves. Uh, everybody is cutting down everything they can, so they are uh, cutting and down raising costs. Prices at the they, same raising time. prices, cutting down costs, uh, removing services, removing uh, limits on services, and so on. So these are the things that are happening mm -hmm. every day. Yeah, 
Okay, so just to, to <coughs> further elaborate the point of uh, our previous discussion, which was documentation, I agree that if you want to really implement infrastructure as a code via Ansible, you definitely need to know how your infrastructure works, which is kind of like the process of documenting things while at the same, same time not being the same. I would uh, make an exception for anybody who does the things that I oftentimes do, uh, especially my shell script code, which is to heavily uh, comment it. So that that's that's what uh, those are just some of the things that bother a lot of people. I, I I have to be honest. I haven't done millions of hours of work with Ansible. I don't have uh, like a hundred different scripts uh, that I have in Bash, which is why we published the. Bash scripting book on Amazon. I don't have that uh, that metaphor on Ansible. I do have some dozens of the uh, let's say YAML um, YAML playbooks that I do, and primarily uh, for the the stuff that we do while working. That's it. Um, the second part of that story is something that I'm doing for PhD, and I have immense amount of Ansible there, but that's not for that's not uh, something that uh, I it's share. commonly used every day. Yeah. But uh, the other thing that I just wanted to uh, touch also as a part of Ansible and all the orchestration things, uh, almost every other project, including the Ansible, almost every pro project that is uh, that has uh, been there uh, for years and years uh, ran into the same problem. They just uh, are right now started to look like what happened to Java or to JavaScript. So they have... Uh, modules. JavaScript, but yeah. They have modules, they have independence.